Welcome to Managed Care Learning Network, Migraine Prevention, New Opportunities for Pain Relief. My name is Jim Kenny, founder and president of JT Kenny LLC, a consulting practice in Waltham, Massachusetts. And our neurologist presented today is Stuart Tepper, professor of neurology, Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, director of Dartmouth Headache Center and Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Our program today is approved for one CME, CNE, CPE, AAPA credit, provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, an HMP company. And this program is supported by an educational grant from Lundbeck. Our learning objectives for today's program are to describe the barriers to the optimal preventive treatment of migraine, to summarize safety and efficacy data of novel medications approved for the preventive treatment of migraine, and to evaluate the role of novel medications for the prevention of migraine in clinical practice and within the healthcare system. So let's begin with the International Classification of Headache Disorders criteria for migraine without aura. So migraine is episodic headache if we have greater than five episodes lasting four to 72 hours with any two of the following, unilateral, throbbing, worsened by movement, moderate or severe, plus any one of the following on the right of your screen, nausea or vomiting, photophobia, and phonophobia. So if there are no secondary causes, the answer here is two plus one, so two from left and one from the right equals migraine. The International Classification of Headache Disorders criteria for tension type headaches is a little different. So ETTH is episodic headache, where there are greater than 10 episodes lasting 30 minutes to seven days with any two of the following items. It's not unilateral, maybe bilateral. It's not throbbing. It doesn't worsen with movement. It's not severe, rather it's mild to moderate, plus one of the criteria on the right, no nausea or vomiting, and either photophobia or phonophobia, or neither, but not both. So minus two plus minus one equals an episodic tension type headache. So there are a number of oral preventative therapies that are actually nonspecific for episodic migraine that are used before monoclonal antibodies based on the U.S. classification and level of evidence. Level A, with established efficacy, the drug classes and agents include the anti-epileptic drugs, divalproxodium, sodium valproate, and topiramate, the beta blockers, metoprolol, propranolol, and timolol, the angiotensin receptor blockers, candesartan, where studies do now suggest level A efficacy. Products in level B as probably effective include antidepressants, the tricyclic antidepressants, and the SNRIs, including amitriptyline and venlafaxine, and the beta blockers, atenolol and adalol. Level C evidence list possibly effective include the ACE inhibitor lisinopril, the beta blockers, nabivolol and tindalol, the alpha agonists, clonidine and guanfacine, the anti-epileptic drug carbamazepine, and the antihistamine cyproheptadine. The only FDA-approved medication for chronic migraine prior to 2018 was onobotulinum toxin A. And now I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Teppa for his presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, we are in a very remarkable time in terms of new acute and preventive treatments for migraine. And a lot of this has to do with calcitonin gene-related peptide, or CGRP. The CGRP is a neuropeptide that belongs to the calcitonin family. It can bind to calcitonin, amylin, adrenomedulin, and canonical CGRP receptors. And CGRP receptors were noted to be present at all migraine pathogenesis sites. CGRP itself is the most potent endogenous vasodilator. Migraine pathophysiology involves the release of CGRP peripherally in the meninges. And when the CGRP is released, a cascade of events occurs which cause pain, nociceptive afferents are activated, and the signal goes back to the central nervous system and is integrated. The peripheral pain mechanisms for migraine that are triggered by the CGRP release include vasodilation, so one can see the CGRP being released in the upper left, 
and then binding postsynaptically. Vessels then dilate and fenestrate, which you can see on the upper right, and neuroinflammatory mediators are released from the vessels and initiate the arachidonic acid cascade and neurogenic inflammation, which you see at the lower left. The result is a combination of intense vasodilation and inflammation, and that's what causes the pain of migraine peripherally, which you can see on the lower right. The link between CGRP and migraine uh, has been shown in multiple ways. If one measures CGRP from the external jugular vein, concentrations rise during spontaneous migraine attacks and fall interictally. After administration of subcutaneous sumatriptan, CGRP serum levels decrease in parallel with symptomatic relief in patients with migraine. In patients with migraine, intravenous infusion of CGRP triggers attacks that are indistinguishable from spontaneous migraine attacks at three or four hours after the infusion. And then finally, the piece de la resistance is that blocking or removing CGRP terminates migraine acutely and can prevent migraine. So all of that links, and that is translational research made real. If we look at our treatments, CGRP understanding gives us some insight into how older treatments as well as newer treatments work. In this cartoon, CGRP is represented by the blue spheres, and the canonical CGRP receptor is a transmembrane receptor, the activation of which is associated with cyclic AMP, and the result of which is vasodilation and neurogenic inflammation, as I showed you. Triptans and ergots, through a serotonin mechanism, prevent CGRP release. They also constrict CGRP dilated vessels. So triptans and ergots actually have an anti-CGRP effect. Lasmiditan, a new drug, prevents CGRP release peripherally. Onobotulinum toxin A prevents CGRP release. The new G-pants, or CGRP receptor antagonists, are small molecules that bind in the CGRP receptor and prevent CGRP from binding to the receptor. And they can be used acutely and preventively, although currently abrogepant and remegepant are FDA-approved only for acute treatment. Atogepant and visegepant are in development. I'll talk about them more in a second. One can create an anti-CGRP receptor monoclonal antibody to prevent CGRP from docking, and the one that we have is arenimab. Finally, we can create anti-CGRP ligand monoclonal antibodies, feminezumab, galconezumab, and eptinezumab, and they bind to the circulating CGRP at the ligand and prevent the CGRP from binding to the receptors. So this is the graphic representation of what has happened in our therapies. In order to understand who gets these medications and why they seem to work across a broad spectrum, it's interesting to look at the relationship of episodic migraine and chronic migraine. Chronic migraine defined as at least 15 headache days per month with at least four hours per day. But when one evaluates patients across time in this large population-based study called the CAMEO study by Richard Lipton. It turns out that patients who have episodic migraine move into chronic migraine and back again into episodic migraine across time. So patients actually do not respect the boundary of 15 or more days. They're going back and forth. The frequency with which patients in episodic migraine move to chronic migraine, that is transform, is about 2.5% in episodic migraine patients across time, as studied in another very large population-based study by Lipton and colleagues called the American Migraine Prevalence and Prevention Study. And our role as providers 
is to see if we can prevent transformation from episodic migraine to chronic migraine in our patients and prevent transfer, uh, transformation to medication overuse as well. We also have an obligation to take chronic migraine patients who may be overusing acute medications and move them back to episodic migraine. And these are the clinical goals that we have in treating our migraine patients. There are predictors for who's at greatest risk of moving from left to right from episodic migraine to chronic migraine. And these include a high baseline frequency of headache, the frequency and type of acute medication use, and for those two endpoints, the higher uh, those two issues, the higher the greater the likelihood of progression. So if patients have a high frequency episodic migraine and they're frequently using acute medications, whether those be analgesics or triptans, they're more likely to progress to chronic migraine. An inadequate or incomplete acute treatment is also a risk for transformation. In terms of difficulty in getting people to go from chronic migraine back to episodic migraine, lower educational levels, those who were previously married, white race, and high frequency of chronic migraine are all risks for difficulty in moving patients from right to left. And allodynia, a marker of central sensitization in which non-painful stimuli are painful, is another risk for failure to remit from chronic migraine to episodic migraine in the AMP study. This just gives you a feel for who you're going to concentrate on as you attempt to treat patients at both ends of the spectrum. I'd like to begin by talking about acute medications in terms, and we usually are using those uh, in all patients, but in some episodic migraine patients, it's all we're using. We're not putting them on prevention. And it turns out that if one evaluates how well an acute treatment works, what you're after is a one-and-done sustained pain-free response. The effectiveness of acute treatment can be measured with a four-item questionnaire, the Migraine Treatment Optimization Questionnaire, or MTOC4, and again, in the uh, AMP study, Lipton evaluated over 5,600 patients who had episodic migraine in 2006 and found that about 3% progressed to chronic migraine in 2007. He then looked at what the response was of those patients to their acute treatment by measuring them with MTOC, and it turned out that if the patients had maximum acute treatment efficacy, one and done, sustained pain-free response, less than 2% of them developed chronic migraine, while those who had very poor acute treatment efficacy had more than twice the risk of new onset of chronic migraine. Almost 7% of them transformed to chronic migraine. Inadequate acute treatment efficacy was associated with an increased risk of new onset chronic migraine over the course of a year. And the hope is that optimal acute treatment might prevent migraine progression. And that was, is one of our goals, to keep people from going from left to right. For that reason, I'd like to talk a little bit about the new acute treatments that have become available for our patients. One of them is lasmiditan. The way lasmiditan works is that it has both peripheral and central effects. Peripherally, it prevents CGRP release. Centrally, it activates serotonin 1F receptors that prevent the integration of migraine and terminate migraine by not allowing it to be processed centrally. The serotonin 1F receptors do not vasoconstrict. So lasmiditan lacks vasoconstrictive activity and is appropriate for patients with vascular disease, unlike triptans, which do vasoconstrict. Two-hour pain freedom with lasmiditan is about a third of patients. There are three doses approved, 50, 100, and 200 milligrams, although only two doses are uh, actually approved at 50 and 100. So for patients to take 200, they have to take two of the 100s. Because lasmiditan penetrates the brain and 
interferes with migraine processing centrally. It has central adverse events, generally mild to moderate, generally dizziness and somnolence. So patients have to be warned to expect these generally mild symptoms. And patients are advised not to drive for eight hours after dosing, even if they don't even appreciate that they have any central nervous system adverse events. Because of the central penetration, lasmiditan is a controlled substance class 5, the same as pregabalin. The next group of approved medications for acute treatment of migraine that are new are the G-pants. The G-pants are small molecule CGRP receptor antagonists, and remember from the figure, they block the CGRP receptor and prevent CGRP from binding. Seven of them have been tested for acute migraine treatment. Early G-pants were liver toxic, but the newer G-pants do not appear to be liver toxic. Ubrojapant and Remegipant uh, were uh, approved this year and late last year and are now available for acute migraine treatment. Two-hour pain freedom for both of them is about 20%, as it is for Vizegipant, which is in development and is a nasal G-pant where phase two data have shown efficacy. The way these work is they prevent the CGRP from binding. They prevent the CGRP from causing the vasodilation. So they do not cause blood vessels to constrict. And unlike triptans, they should be safe in people with vascular disease. I'll give you some more data on the G-pants. Here are um, two phase three trials for Ubrojapant looking at the primary endpoint that the FDA mandates, which is the likelihood of two-hour pain freedom post-dose. And you can see the 20% range for 50 and 100 milligrams of ubrojapant. Both also achieve the other FDA-mandated co-primary endpoint of the relief of most bothersome symptom, which the patient chooses from photophobia, phonophobia, or nausea. And that has to be gone at two hours versus placebo as well. The efficacy of ubrojapant and the efficacy of remegipant look identical. And it doesn't matter whether one is looking at remegipant tablets or remegipant orally dissolvable tablets, still at about 20% pain-free at two hours. So there's not a lot of difference between ubrojapant and remegipant from an efficacy standpoint. Ubrojapant is only available in tablets. Remegipant is only available as an orally dissolvable tablet. Both are extremely well tolerated and have good safety um, outcomes. No cardiovascular or liver safety concerns have been identified with any of them. Liver safety was evaluated rather extensively and intensively with both because of the previous problems with the earlier G-pants and repetitive uh, exposures have not revealed any significant liver toxicity for ubrojapant or remegipant. Here are the remegipant adverse events from um, randomized control trials. You can see that nausea occurs anywhere from 0.7 to 2% over placebo. Um, some people will report dizziness, but it was only in 1% of patients and 1% of placebo exposed patients. And the really strong uh, aspect to tell patients when they're taking G-pants is to take them early because they take a little while to work and to not expect side effects. They almost never cause any tolerability side effects. And remember, the G-pants prevent the vasodilation but do not cause vasoconstriction. So both G-pants and lasmiditan are appropriate for patients with known vascular disease, which gets us to who should receive the new acute treatments. The American Headache Society published a position statement on this in 2019 that was worked out with payers and regulators. And it, they felt uh, as a society that the new treatments, the new acute treatments should be available to be prescribed by any licensed healthcare provider to patients with migraine who either have contraindications to triptans, meaning vascular disease, or a lack of adequate response or tolerability to at least two oral triptans that have been tried on at least two attacks each 
to evaluate efficacy and tolerability. There are quite a lot of patients who don't do well with triptans, and so there are probably quite a number of patients who are uh, candidates for the new treatment to see if a more appropriate and optimal acute treatment can be achieved. Now I'd like to move on to the preventive treatment landscape. And uh, prior to 2018, as uh, Jim showed you, there were a number of oral preventive medications that were FDA approved for migraine prevention. These were nonspecific medicines that were developed in other therapeutic areas. They're all generic, and we were obligated to use them. But the problem with them has been that patients don't like them. And in a very remarkable claims database analysis uh, of 8,688 patients, of those placed on the conventional preventive agents, such as tricyclics, beta blockers, and anti-epilepsy drugs for chronic migraine, 83% of the patients with migraine discontinued their preventive treatment over one year, which is a, an exercise in clinical futility. Uh, in addition, uh, a, su a subsequent large study of 1,165 patients evaluated why patients came off these oral preventive medicines and lack of efficacy or side effects were the most common reason. So we were in a pretty bad situation as of 2018. And the question is what the future holds with respect to new prevention. We, we clearly need to do better than this. One possibility, not yet here, is to use G-pants for prevention of migraine. And remember, the G-pants block that CGRP receptor, and they can terminate migraine acutely. But it turned out that the more that patients took G-pants, the less headache they had. So in the long-term safety study of Remegipant, patients with at least 14 migraine days per month were taking as-needed remegipan to terminate their attacks, and instead of going into medication overuse headache or rebound, they had a reduction in their migraine days per month at three months. Subsequently, it's become quite clear that G-pants do not cause transformation to chronic migraine or medication overuse headache, and in fact, they prevent migraine. There was an older G-pant that was studied in this way, but now we have phase two and phase three studies on atojapant in daily dosing, and both have been reported as effective. And remegipant in an every other day randomized controlled trial for prevention also was positive for migraine prevention and has been submitted to the FDA for this indication. So what we anticipate is that G-pants will be approved for acute treatment, G-pants will be approved for preventive treatment. In the case of remegipant, it'll be approved for both acute and preventive treatment. And this really will be quite a change in how we treat patients who want oral prevention. Uh, here are the atojapant data in the phase two trial for episodic migraine prevention. The average number of migraine days in episodic migraine studies is about six to eight, in this case about seven and a half days per month of migraine, and the atojapant dropped the number of mean monthly migraine days by about four, so down to three mean monthly migraine days, which is more than half, and that's pretty much what uh, you see with the monoclonal antibodies. So I would anticipate that G-pants and monoclonal antibodies will share opportunity for helping patients with both episodic and chronic migraine. Let's move on to the monoclonal antibodies. They were developed because of the early G-pant liver toxicity, and they are removed by the reticuloendothelial system, so there's no liver toxicity with them. They are large molecules that do not pass into the brain for the most part, and to give you a feel for the size, you see an anti-CGRP uh, monoclonal antibody at the bottom and a G-pant, and the uh, monoclonal antibody is the size of a truck, and the G-pant is the size of a grain of rice. Sen Shu on the bottom right is the scientist who developed the team, uh, who was the lead on the team that developed arenumab. The fact that these monoclonal antibodies do not cross into the brain for the most part 
suggest that they work peripherally to prevent migraine and that a peripheral benefit is sufficient to prevent migraine. It's likely that the GPAMs don't go into the brain much either, and that could explain their absence of side effects. These are the four injectable monoclonal antibodies FDA approved to CGRP or its receptor. Each one has a four-letter nonsense suffix that the FDA has appended in order to help distinguish our current monoclonal antibodies from future biosimilars. The first one approved is the one on the left, arenumab. And arenumab is the only one that targets the canonical CGRP receptor. I would say that despite the differences in whether it targets CGRP itself or the receptor, the efficacy on these all is about the same. Arenumab is available in a 70 and 140 milligram dose in an auto-injector that the patient self-inject monthly subcutaneously. The other three all target the CGRP peptide or ligand itself. Fremenezumab is available both as a monthly or quarterly dosing, 225 milligrams monthly or 675 milligrams quarterly. All of these, all four of these, are approved for all of migraine, episodic and chronic. Galcanezumab, which also targets the CGRP ligand, is available as a monthly subcutaneous dose. And for migraine, there's a 240 milligram loading dose and then 120 milligram sub-Q monthly thereafter. Galcanezumab is also the only medication FDA approved for the prevention of episodic cluster headache. Different dose, 300 milligram subcutaneous and then monthly to a, an episodic cluster cycle end. But it's a big change to finally have an FDA-approved medication for um, uh, prevention of cluster. Eptinezumab is, is the only monoclonal antibody that is available as an infusion. It's a quarterly IV infusion of 100 milligrams or 300 milligram doses. Here are the four of them. Arenumab on the upper left is the one that's against the receptor, and so you can see the antibody binding to the CGRP receptor. The other three bind to the CGRP itself, the little blue sphere, and you can see fremenezumab on the bottom left binding to the CGRP, and remember that fremenezumab is the one that's available subcutaneous monthly or quarterly. Galcanezumab up in the upper right binds to the CGRP and is the only one that is approved for both migraine and prevention of episodic cluster headache, different doses, subcutaneous monthly only. And then finally, eptinezumab bottom right, an antibody against the CGRP ligand, but is the only one that's available intravenous and quarterly. There are three major questions on the monoclonal antibodies. Are they safe? Are they different than what we had? And are they an improvement? Always start with safety. The most common side effect with them was injection site reaction for the three that are subcutaneous injections. Um, constipation has been described with all three. There is a warning in the U.S. prescribing information on constipation with arenumab in particular. Liver abnormalities have not been seen. Some patients develop the sniffles with them, uh, but so far not with every product and not always in excess of placebo. There's a new warning in the U.S. arenumab prescribing information for uh, elevation of blood pressure, not severe, but enough to warrant monitoring blood pressure for all of these, I believe. And then the question has been, whether losing CGRP or its receptor might result in loss of compensatory vasodilation in the setting of angina or um, a TIA, and we want to make sure that patients can vasodilate. I'm going to talk about that in a second, and I would finally add that all four of them have a risk for an allergic reaction, including angioedema, although this turns out to be quite rare. So this question about cardiovascular safety for these is whether if you take out CGRP, which is such a potent vasodilator, 
whether you're putting people at risk when they have angina or um, cerebrovascular disease. This was a remarkable study published in 2018 in which uh, 88 patients with angina at least monthly and documented coronary artery disease were uh, asked to do two treadmills, and each of the treadmills they had to precipitate angina as measured on a cardiogram, and the treadmills had to be identical. Then on a third treadmill, they were either given intravenous arenimab, and remember arenimab is a subcutaneous drug as we use it, or placebo prior to their third treadmill. The intravenous arenimab was felt to take out the CGRP biology instantaneously. And on the third treadmill, there was no difference in the length of the treadmill and the magnitude of the EKG changes or the angina, no infarctions, no evidence for failure of compensatory vasodilation mechanisms. And it's felt that this probably shows that vasodilation is a redundant system with multiple uh, mediators for vasodilation and taking out one CGRP is insufficient to put people at risk. There have been no vascular signals in three to five year data for all three, but as with any new class of medications, clinical vigilance remains important. Still, this is a very reassuring study. What about efficacy? Well, all three of them drop the mean monthly migraine days pretty much at the same level, and all three work similarly to what I showed you for a tojapant. So for episodic migraine, if a patient has about seven mean monthly migraine days at the onset, these drugs drop the likelihood of migraine down to about three migraine days per month which is a pretty significant drop for an episodic migraine patient with significant disability. In the chronic migraine studies, the same primary endpoint of reduction in mean monthly migraine days, and again, a drop of four to six mean monthly migraine days at three months compared to placebo uh, and from baseline. The um, difference here, of course, is that patients with chronic migraine in these studies had 16 to 18 migraine days per month. So a drop of six migraine days per month is still pretty significant uh, for a patient with chronic migraine. And the approval is for all of these uh, monoclonal antibodies for both episodic and chronic. But are they an improvement on what we have now? I'm going to come back to this in, in a repetitive manner and show you different ways of evaluating that. But one way is to look at the 75% drop in mean monthly migraine days or greater than that. And between 41 and 54% of patients in these studies had at least a 75% drop in mean monthly migraine days by one year. And in one of the studies for eptinezumab, this was a placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trial across one year, and 54% of patients had at least a 75% drop in mean monthly migraine days. That's a very dramatic drop in likelihood of migraine and unprecedented. Other secondary endpoints include effectiveness with comorbid illnesses and improvement in patient reported outcomes such as disability, impact, and satisfaction. The onset of effect for these monoclonal antibodies is also quite remarkable and different than our previous medications. Uh, they have unprecedented fast onset in all of the pivotal studies for, all, for episodic and chronic migraine for all four of them. They all separate from placebo in less than one week. And for eptinezumab, prospectively studied, the likelihood of a migraine was dropped by greater than 50% within 24 hours of the infusion. And this is for both episodic and chronic migraine. And so eptinezumab is also being studied for acute treatment in the emergency room. Fremonezumab also showed reduced likelihood of migraine-associated features, nausea, photophobia, phonophobia, in less than a week. So although a lot of patients need to remain on these for four to eight months to see full effectiveness, and effectiveness improves across time, some patients have very dramatic effects very early. Our target patients are those with a lack of response to multiple previous preventive medications. And, all, and the three subcutaneous 
monoclonal antibodies have been studied in three-month randomized controlled trials versus placebo in patients who had a lack of success with at least two to four previous migraine preventive medications, and um, all three worked, and all three worked with a magnitude similar to those who did not have two to four previous preventive medication lack of success. So it looks like they work very well in our target patients who have had a lack of success with these treatments. They are effective and approved for all migraine, as I said, episodic and chronic, with and without aura, and with and without acute medication overuse. And what has proven to be very important clinically is they reduce acute migraine medication the use on a daily basis or a frequent basis in both episodic migraine, which reduces the risk of transformation from episodic to chronic migraine, and in chronic migraine, in those who already have medication overuse, converting them back to episodic migraine and out of medication overuse. For example, in those using acute medicines at least 10 days a month, Eptinizumab reduced the acute medication use days by at least 50% for both episodic and chronic migraine by month three. For fremenizumab, in the randomized control trial of chronic migraine, 813 patients with chronic migraine at baseline, 548 had reverted below 15 headache days per month uh, by, by three months. In arenimab, in their chronic migraine trial, 72% of those who completed the open-label extension trial had converted from chronic migraine to episodic migraine, slightly higher with the higher dosage. And again, this was true with galcanezumab as well. So one way to look, another way to look at this is what about the patients who had medication overuse at baseline and who changed status to non-medication overuse by month three? And all of them have shown benefit all of them have shown conversion out of rebound into non-rebound, and this has been true for simple analgesics, triptans, and combination therapy. And this uh, figure is for arenimab. But this is quite a change in our paradigm because we can give these drugs to patients who are in medication overuse and know that more than half of them are going to convert out of medication overuse pretty rapidly within three months and considerably higher numbers than that by the end of a year. One way to think about this is that the CGRP is maintaining migraine despite the, you know, regardless of what the migraine type is. So oxygen to fire is as CGRP is to migraine. If you deprive a fire, migraine, of oxygen, CGRP, it won't matter if the fire is a wood fire, a coal fire, or a paper fire, the fire is extinguished. And that's why the, if you take out CGRP or its receptor for episodic migraine, chronic migraine, with or without aura, with or without acute medication overuse, the migraine is prevented and the patients remit. It's really quite a remarkable turn of events and suggests we have the correct target for the majority of migraine patients. Now, how do we evaluate whether they are superior to previous migraine preventive medications? One will sometimes hear that therapeutic gain analysis at three months by subtraction of placebo is adequate and uh, the drugs don't look very different. But the problem with doing that is it doesn't take into account the adverse events, which were uh, one of the main reasons, the side effects being one of the main reasons that patients are coming off the older drugs. So a better way to look at this might be an evaluation of NNT and NNH. And taking you through this, therapeutic gain is defined as the active response minus the placebo response in a randomized control trial. The number needed to treat, or NNT, is the reciprocal of the therapeutic gain. For NNT, the lower the value, the better. You don't want to have to treat a lot of patients before you see a therapeutic benefit. Therapeutic harm is the active adverse events minus the placebo adverse events. Number needed to harm, or NNH, is the reciprocal of therapeutic harm. So for NNH, the higher the value, the better. You don't want to see a lot of side effects treating a few pa people. You want to treat a lot of patients before you have to, to handle a side effect. 
And you can do an NNH to NNT ratio analysis, which is the likelihood of being helped or harmed. And again, the higher the value, the better. The NNH to NNT ratio describes the value of an intervention as a risk-benefit analysis number. And if you uh, want to incorporate placebo response as well as adverse events and efficacy, the NNH to NNT ratio is probably the best way to do that. Here's a study uh, by Pam Vo and colleagues published in 2019 that evaluated the NNH to NNT ratios for arenimab, topiramate, onabotulinum toxin A, topiramate, and propranolol. Again, you want the lowest possible, uh, the highest possible value for the NNH to NNT ratio. You want to have to treat a lot of patients before you see trouble. Uh, the NNH to NNT ratios were quite low for topiramate, onabotulinum toxin, and propranolol, two to four, while for arenimab, they were 42 to 167. And that suggests that when you take the whole picture of adverse events and efficacy, the new drugs are in fact superior to the older drugs and do in fact represent a paradigm shift. It's very, very exciting for uh, clinicians and for patients alike. Who should get these new preventive treatments? Again, we can return to the American Headache Society position statement from 2019. They should be available to be prescribed by any licensed healthcare provider to migraine patients who meet the following criteria. For episodic migraine, the patient should have had a lack of success with at least two of, and these are the medications that Jim showed at the beginning, anti-epilepsy drugs, tricyclics, beta blockers, or SNRIs. So that would be valparate, topiramate, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, propranolol, metoprolol, venlafaxine, duloxetine, or other level A or B migraine preventive medicines. So if a patient has had a lack of success with two of those, either because of um, lack of efficacy or lack of tolerability or other safety issues, they should be eligible and they, in the case of low-frequency episodic migraine, it is worth documenting their disability. In the case of high-frequency episodic migraine, you probably don't need to document the disability. They're clearly impacted, so it really just becomes uh, a lack of success with those uh, two categories. For chronic migraine, again, a lack of success with two categories, or if a chronic migraine patient has received onabotulinum toxin A with either a lack of efficacy or a uh, lack of tolerability, that alone should allow a patient to receive the new treatment. And again, no need to document disability because chronic migraine patients are clearly impacted. These uh, position statements, both for acute and preventive, are available uh, online and the copyright has been lifted so you can download these for use when you uh, appeal to payers. And a lot of the payers, I would say the majority of the payers, have abided by this uh, AHS position statement for patients to obtain these medications. How are they given? Arenimab and galcanezumab self-inject monthly. You can see the arenimab auto-injector in the middle, the galcanezumab auto-injector on the right, and galcanezumab is also available as a pre-filled syringe. Fremenezumab, remember, is for either monthly or quarterly injection, and it too is available either as a pre-filled syringe or an auto-injector, which you see in the bottom left. And eptinezumab is an intravenous infusion every three months. So this is just to give you the practical way that you would be advising patients in terms of use. Remember that the side effects are so low that most patients do very, very, very well with these. So in conclusion, the best acute treatment of migraine optimizes the likelihood of a sustained pain-free response, and in doing so, it reduces the likelihood of transformation from episodic to chronic migraine. Paying attention to what patients experience with an acute treatment, making sure that they're pain-free at two hours and not just having relief, making sure that they don't have adverse events that would prevent them from using the acute treatment, or recurrence of the headache, paying attention to optimization of acute treatment can be very helpful in keeping patients in episodic migraine from progressing to chronic migraine. 
CGRP is pivotal in migraine pathophysiology and translational research. And the translational research linked the CGRP to multiple anti-migraine treatments, including triptans, lasmiditan, onabotulinum toxin A, G-pants, and monoclonal antibodies. The AHS position statement of January of 2019 provides guidance for selection of patients for the new acute and preventive treatments and is available for you and is a very good way to uh, interact with both patients and payers in order to uh, make sure that the patients who are reasonable candidates for these medications get them. But you have to ask the question whether the step edits are the correct way to go. And in recent data at, presented at the American Headache Society scientific meeting in June of, this, of 2020, Richard Lipton, again, in a very large population-based study of over 20,000 patients, showed that if one looked at whether the patients who had rather significant disability, at least four migraine days per month, and um, moderate to severe disability, whether what in the population, how many of them would be eligible for these new treatments, it was pretty discouraging. And at least 60% of the patients who had at least four migraine days per month and at least moderate to severe disability, at least 60% of them had never had a single preventive agent. That really raises the question of whether the step edits are the correct way to go. And so I'd like to leave you with a concluding quote from Dr. David Dodick, who is chair of the American Brain Foundation. David said, I see a day within our careers when it will not be acceptable to treat patients by having them cycle through a ragtag group of drugs that over 80% will stop within a year just to get to disease-specific and mechanism-based treatments that were specifically designed to treat this disease. And I, I've come around to agreeing with this. I, I'm beginning to think that we need to appropriately treat patients based on the severity of their illness. Okay, let's proceed with our question and answer section of the presentations. First question relates to uh, cardiovascular risk, and uh, given that the triptans are contraindicated in patients with CV risk. Are the new anti-CGRP therapies safe in patients with vascular disease? We think so. Uh, there, are, um, there are no contraindications to use of the monoclonal antibodies or the G-pants in patients with vascular disease. And the mechanism of action by taking out either CGRP or targeting the CGRP receptor or blocking the CGRP receptor prevents vasodilation but does not cause vasoconstriction. And um, we now have safety studies, uh, three-year data on fremenezumab and galconezumab and five-year data on arenumab and no new cardiovascular signals have evolved. So I think I can speak for headache specialists across the country that we are using both the monoclonal antibodies and the G-pants in patients with vascular disease where triptans are contraindicated. Great, and typically plans would have steps through these where appropriate, but obviously that would be a, a, a pass, if you will, if there was a CV risk. Uh, next question, uh, this is a good one. Since the response to current generic or prophylactic agents is generally poor, are we putting the patient at risk for adverse outcomes by requiring them to step through multiple first-line agents? And in the case of the plan designs, since these are generic and low cost, they're very often placed as a step. I think it's penny wise and pound foolish to require these old medicines for patients with migraine. And the evidence I have for that is a, a very large population-based um, study that was published in 2015 in which patients were placed on the oral preventive medicines for migraine, and 83% of them had been discontinued by the end of the year due to either lack of efficacy or side effects. Some of the side effects, of course, are pretty significant, whether it be kidney stones or cognitive dysfunction or weight gain, the list goes on and on. So I come around to the view that these step edits are costly. They delay getting the appropriate treatment to patients that merit them, that have significant disability. And uh, I don't think they're the right um, choice for patients. And I do think they expose patients to excessive risk. Yeah, and I think from a plan perspective, sometimes for the, due to out-of-pocket costs, patients may choose to go down that path, but it sounds like P&T committees should consider 
uh, avoiding that uh, step if it's really not going to lead to good success, uh, obviously. Uh, next question is uh, one that uh, I think came up when we reviewed these therapies at PNT, and that is, is there a clinical difference between the CGRP inhibitors based on the site of action, whether they target the receptor or the ligand? And we've seen across the country some formularies have chosen two drugs that target the ligand, some have chosen one of each. It would be helpful to get feedback on that, Dr. Tepa. From a formulary perspective, what's the best options? We don't have any evidence that there's any difference in efficacy between the anti-CGRP receptor monoclonal antibody, arenimab, and the other three that target the CGRP ligand. Uh, there may be slight differences in constipation uh, for arenimab, but even that is controversial in the other three. Um, er, at least I've seen constipation with uh, the two other subcutaneous anti-CGRP ligand monoclonal antibodies. However, I'm pretty sure, and uh, there have been publications already uh, describing patients who did not respond to the anti receptor monoclonal antibody and did respond to the anti-ligand monoclonal antibody and vice versa. I've seen it clinically and I've seen it reported. And my own preference for payers would be that they should include at least one uh, anti-ligand monoclonal antibody and, and the anti-CGRP receptor monoclonal antibody so that we can move patients if they don't respond to one or the other. This is based on the slight differences in mechanisms, even though you would think they would uh, be the same, they don't appear to be for everyone. Oh, very interesting answer. So something that should be considered by the formulary committees when they choose their options in this space. Uh, I'm going to combine the next two questions. One is, uh, would triptans be more useful than GPANs for acute therapy of migraines? And then just a question in terms of how long it takes each of those two groups of products to exert their effects. Not all triptans are the same. There are five fast-acting triptans, Suma, Zolma, Riza, Almo, and Ella, and two slow-acting triptans, uh, Nera and Frova. The fast-acting triptans do uh, result in higher percentages of patients pain-free at two hours when compared to G-pants. G-pants... Um, almost all have about a 20% pain-free likelihood at two hours, and that is lower than the fast-acting triptans. Uh, so where speed is of essence, and in patients that don't have vascular disease, uh, triptans might be more appropriate. I tend to start with triptans in any case for patients that don't have vascular disease, and only after several triptans have failed, either due to lack of efficacy or uh, lack of tolerability on multiple attacks, will I make a switch to the G-pants? So they're, they're different, uh, and obviously we don't have a choice. Patients with vascular disease can be prescribed G-pants or lasmiditan, uh, and patients who don't want any side effects, uh, G-pants uh, may offer uh, better tolerability than the fast-acting triptans. Thank you, Dr. Tepa. The next question is, uh, have you researched the effectiveness of Botox for migraine prevention, and do, what are your recommendations either for or against its use? I was uh, one of the investigators on the regulatory trials for uh, onabotulinum toxin A. Um, they were the so-called preempt trials that led to FDA approval. And onabotulinum toxin A is one of the five medications that the FDA has approved for prevention of chronic migraine, the other four being the monoclonal antibodies. And uh, we, I, uh, we know that onabotulinum toxin A is highly effective in preventing chronic migraine. We don't have a comparator trial comparing onabot with the monoclonal antibodies, but I think they are of comparable effectiveness in chronic migraine. The monoclonal antibodies are also approved for episodic migraine, and Onabot is not approved for episodic migraine. But in patients with chronic migraine, I do offer them a choice uh, between Onabot and monoclonal antibodies after they've done the, the requisite step edits that payers require. Thank you. Uh, this next question is a very good one. I think um, this is something that uh, would certainly come up from a plan management perspective, and that is, can G-pants be used acutely when a patient is on an anti-CGRP therapy monoclonal antibody? Because often what happens with the claim systems is they might see this as a duplicate therapy edit, 
and reject the shorter acting G-pants if someone already has a prescription within the previous 30 days for a monoclonal antibody. It's a really important question, I agree. We now have multiple case series of patients, uh, both published and presented at meetings as abstracts, showing that G-pants do work very well in patients who are on monoclonal antibody, and one recent study showing safety for patients using G-pants on monoclonal antibody. So just to to point it out, the monoclonals are used for the prevention and the G-pants are used for the acute treatment. And the reason that they work is that the monoclonals don't take out 100% of all of the CGRP or the CGRP receptors. They leave 10 or 20% of the CGRP or the receptors available and mischief can occur when CGRP binds to the CGRP receptor and the patient gets a migraine on, even though they're on monoclonal antibodies, they get the occasional migraine breakthrough. And if the monoclonal antibodies are working, it probably predicts that the GPAN's going to work to terminate an attack during uh, the breakthroughs. So I think it's a mistake on the part of payers to not cover, especially for patients with vascular disease, and I suspect that it's going to be resolved in the next year and payers are going to recognize that they need to cover GPAN's for patients on monoclonal antibodies. Great. Thank you very much. And that clearly is a challenge because the plans do apply that duplicate therapy logic routinely. And if it doesn't make sense, you obviously you want patients to have access to appropriate treatment options. So thank you for that. That's very interesting. So that concludes our questions for today. I just want to remind you that you will be redirected back to the landing page to complete the post-test and evaluation. And then you can download and print your certificate for CE credit. And I want to thank Dr. Tepper and, and thank all of you for attending and wish everyone a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day.